Here, here, the Humanitarian Podcast, a podcast by Here Geneva. Founded in 2014, Here Geneva turns 10 in November this year. The system and its internal dynamics have changed very little over the past decade. From the start, Here focused on the discrepancy between policy and practice, building evidence and putting forward constructive analyses of where the gaps are and where gains can be made for governments and agencies to fulfill their humanitarian responsibilities and commitments. In the lead up to our anniversary, join us as we look back on previous work, highlighting the lessons and recommendations that past pieces have brought up and exploring any outcomes, follow up or lack thereof. This episode is but one of many components of our retrospective. You can find the full series at here-geneva.org forward slash here10. In the wake of the latest interagency humanitarian evaluation, which found that the UN-led response in northern Ethiopia amounted to system failure, Louis Saida and Julius Dietz joined Ed Schenkenberg, here Geneva's executive director, to discuss such evaluations, their value and purpose, their follow-up, and their future. All three participants have experience with interagency humanitarian evaluations, also known as IAHEs. One of few ways available to independently assess collective humanitarian action, IAHEs are automatically triggered when the Global Body for Humanitarian Coordination, the Interagency Standing Committee, decides to call on the humanitarian system to mobilize its operational capacity. An obligation of external evaluation follows from this decision. IAHEs are not an in-depth evaluation of any one sector or of the performance of a specific organization, but they look at how humanitarian organizations, especially those of the UN family, worked together in achieving better results for people affected by crises. Lewis is co-director of the Humanitarian Learning Center at IDS and works as a consultant on a range of humanitarian issues, including policy and strategy, evaluation and response. Recent projects of note include the IASC Independent Review of Internal Displacement and the Interagency Humanitarian Evaluation of Yemen. Julia is director of the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin, where she has been working for 20 years. She is responsible for leading GPPI's evaluation practice and was the team leader for the IAG of the drought response in Ethiopia. She also provided peer review and quality assurance for the 2024 IAG of the response to the crisis in northern Ethiopia, led by Ed. This episode of Here Here jumps straight into the thick of it. My name is Vahan Bieber-Bruggen. Welcome to the podcast. Well, Julia, actually, you started in, what was it, 18, doing an interagency humanitarian evaluation of the drought response in, in Ethiopia. At that time, to what degree was the concept of interagency humanitarian evaluations even known uh, on the ground? What, was this something, because it was probably one of the first that was undertaken? That might be true, but I think people understood pretty quickly what the what the concept was. It's not what they're used to. They're, people are used to the, the classic evaluations that are either for an agency or for a program or for a project. And they might have been a little bit confused as to where this was coming from. But since it's anchored in the protocols, and you can point to this, the acceptance was quite quite fast. And I actually thought that people were interested in this because otherwise you always get such a fragmented picture and also for me personally I think the the opportunity to to look at a response as a as a whole and to be able to ask at the end of the day all of us taken together did we make a difference or, or not is pretty unique um, and is special and and is very very valuable and I got a sense that especially people in in more management positions saw that and and valued it Lewis what's your experience in Yemen in in that sense did people see the importance and the relevance of an interagency humanitarian evaluation looking at the collective response? Yes, absolutely. But maybe I'll go back to my first interagency humanitarian evaluation, which was actually Ethiopia as well. And that was back in 2011. That was the Horn of Africa crisis. That was a a drought across the Horn that, of course, famously led to the famine in in Somalia, where we had 250,000 excess deaths in 2011. So I did the Ethiopia one. And there was James Darcy did Somalia shortly after that, the UN kiboshed them. John Ging uh, famously decided that he didn't particularly like accountability, and so system-wide evaluations were axed. And then they were brought back again, pretty much as Julia started them off in, in Ethiopia. So fast forward to Yemen, I was very lucky in that we had a new, relatively new humanitarian coordinator who actually wanted to understand the collective impact that Julia talked about, David Gressley. And so we were, we were welcomed at that point. They wanted us. I guess it's that 
serendipitous moment where you get somebody who doesn't really have a dog in the fight and wants to know whether we've actually made a difference or not. And then, you know, on the basis of that evidence, think about what their programme should be. And that doesn't happen that often. But we did have a sort of relatively benign environment for Yemen, although, as I guess we'll talk about, it wasn't exclusively benign because there are always people who don't want to know or, or, or at least don't don't want to be held to account as, as, as well as the people who do. Let's talk about that a little bit more then in the sense of particularly, not, but not only, but particularly since the World Humanitarian Summit, many commitments around working collectively, collective action, collective results, and, and so on. Obviously, in that sense, interagency humanitarian evaluations look at the collective response. Lewis, to what degree do agencies, because obviously performance indicators for people within agencies are mostly what they do for the organization. So to what degree you can refer to people in coordination positions, which obviously particularly are interested in these evaluations that look at collective response. But yeah, the accountability lines and so on are much more organized by individual agencies. So perhaps you could explain a little bit in terms of the issue around trying to establish collective accountability, whereas in fact all the accountability lines are particularly focused on individual agency performance. And it is what people within agencies are sort of used to in terms of what they're, what they're judged on is what they do for their individual agency. What would you say to that? Yeah, so like Julia, I have always seen incredible value in these exercises because they are that rare moment where you can step back and look at the whole rather than individual parts. This business of collective response, ultimately, we are a collective endeavour, the humanitarian system. Even in refugee crises where you have an agency with a mandate that is used to working multi-sexually, they still need others to help them. The scale of the crisis is always bigger than one agency, so you still need the WFP and the UNICEFs and the NGOs and the local actors and sometimes the government. I've just finished doing an IDP review for the ISC and that reminded me that that is by design a collective effort. When we look at our response to humanitarian emergencies and we're all in our day to day, but sometimes you need to step back and say, are we making a difference? Have we achieved what we set out to achieve? And we do have these collective objectives in the humanitarian appeals, in the, in the, in the, in the response plans, in the HRPs. These are rare moments where we can ask, have we done what we set out to do? Now, that doesn't speak directly to people's day to day accountability, the management line and whether they get promoted or their 360 degree performance review. But what it does speak to is very much the purpose, the mission. You know, we're a values based sector at the end of the day. People who work in this sector, by and large, really want to make a difference. So I think morally, there is an accountability in these big exercises that say whether we're achieving what we set out to achieve. And I think people are invested in that. And that's why I think Julie is right that when you get on the ground and start doing this, people are really interested. Julia, any views to add here in terms of your experiences previously in Ethiopia or at the moment in um, in Somalia? I think I would. I do subscribe to everything that Lewis said there, and I do think that that drive of wanting to do the right thing is still very strong in the humanitarian sector, and that there's also actually a stronger willingness to look critically at are we actually achieving that, to the extent that sometimes it seems to me that the people are self-flagellating and, and never in their own standards achieving as much as they would want to. They're always see how they're still falling short, how there are still people suffering. And I think that is very deeply ingrained in like the, the humanitarian DNA. But that said, for this interagency exercise in, in particular, I do think that we have a problem in the sense that a, a collective responsibility is also a dispersed responsibility and accountability. And it becomes hard to find the entry point and to find the mechanisms that then ensure that something is, is happening. Now, I do hear that they keep revising the protocols for these kinds of exercises. There's a second question of how much the protocols are then adhered to. But what I hear is that it becomes a clearer responsibility of the humanitarian coordinator to then afterwards also ensure that there is follow up, that there is linkages into the global level and a management response and actual action taken on, on the responsibility. So some steps, but I agree that for individual agencies, you need to have people who who really, really want that, nobody will force them. We don't have a, a stick. Um, we, we have sort of altruistic carrots that we can offer. 
Thanks. We're going to talk about follow-up or questions around follow-up of these kind of evaluations and where the responsibility lies for that. But before that, Louis, I think you already a little bit alluded to the issue in terms of the opportunities, but also perhaps, well, obstacles or, or certain issues that you run into in the context of Yemen. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I think there are two broad issues. First, Julia's expressed it very eloquently. There's the individual agencies who, whilst the leadership might want a system-wide evaluation, and some of the agencies might want a system-wide evaluation, if you get big, powerful agency interests that don't want an evaluation, that can make it very difficult. They can they can be real blockers. In the case of Yemen, the other, and I'll be really interested to hear your experience in Ethiopia after this, Ed, because I think it it mirrors it. And, you know, I really want you to tell that story, too. But in Yemen, when we started out, people said, oh, you'll never get there. So access was a real issue because the UN themselves had hardly been out of the compound in Sana'a. Um, So in areas controlled by Ansar Allah, by the Houthis, there was this narrative that you basically just couldn't get out there and you couldn't see anything. And what was the point in doing an evaluation? And we had to push really, really hard to persuade them that we could do that, that the purpose of this exercise was for us to go and see and be those eyes and ears and that accountability mechanism and, you know, check on the quality and check on progress, what had actually been done. And we had to fight to get visas. We had to fight to get permissions. We didn't have visas to go to the Ansar Allah areas. So we went to, to the IRG areas. We were in Arden right up until the last minute. We didn't know whether we'd get visas for the Houthi areas. And then we got Sana'a. And then even in Sana'a, people were saying, oh, you'll never get outside of Sana'a the scamsha won't let you and then we pushed and we pushed and eventually we did get outside of Sanar as well and and of course what we found was that 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 lack of presence and lack of monitoring had led to all sorts of issues around the quality and the delivery but we had to really push hard to get the access and and so I think there are two things there one is that you can have powerful blockers, even if the collective, by and large, desires it. And when the collective, by and large, doesn't desire it, which is your experience, which you're going to tell us in a second, <laughs> that's even more difficult. And then you've got the practical issues of access, where you've got to be really tenacious. But, Ed, tell us about Ethiopia. Happy to tell you a few things about Ethiopia. And, and Julia, I'm also curious about your reaction on this. Link, Lewis, to what you said, there was definitely a willingness, absolutely, among the people who had been involved in the response from the various agencies to be engaged in the range humanitarian evaluation and, and to speak to us. But where I do feel it or felt a tension, and perhaps still is a tension, is between the learning purpose of the IAG and the accountability and kind of the question, who really wants accountability in that sense? Now, I already uh, mentioned the point in terms of it's about accountability in terms of what you do for your agency, much less so for, for the collective. But the, the other element that we particularly, I think, came across is that clearly these evaluations are also expected to bring up good news or to point to experiences, to good practices, as you know, they could be extrapolated or they could be, mean good news, not only for the response that took place, but particularly also for, for the future. My take on that is one learns from mistakes one doesn't necessarily learn from good practices so you know you need to address the issue and and you need to reflect you need to address it where did things go wrong and the problem particularly that we saw for the response to northern Ethiopia a lot of things went very wrong particularly in terms of working collectively particularly what you also mentioned Lewis in terms of of access we did have fortunately we were able to to travel to the regions but obviously during the war access was much more problematic and and there was not even an access strategy that was agreed on. Even the underlying sort of policies or strategies were, were, not, were not there. Highlighting all these gaps for us meant, yeah, it's more accountability, pointing to the gaps and who's responsible for those. And, you know, learn from that, really, rather than, you know, we're able to highlight so many good practices because actually we didn't find many. Of course, one should point to good practice, but the question then I always have is what does one really learn f- from those? But Julia, you may have another perspective on that, please. I do, I do, and we talked about this um, when uh, when we were discussing the results of the, the Ethiopia evaluation. I have two takes on this, uh, and one of them is inspired by, especially by Somalia, where I think, I mean, this is one of the longest 
crises, ongoing crises that sees a large scale humanitarian response. And if you look at the situation now, there's probably nothing new in terms of what's going wrong that you could possibly discover. It has all been there and it's all been seen and written up and discussed before. And therefore, sort of one thing that we try to do, always having at the back of our minds that what we want to achieve through these evaluations is to actually contribute to change, change at country level, change at global level, is to say, okay, let's not try and figure out, you know, what's been going well, what's not been going so well, but really look at everything that has been on the table for sometimes decades and ask, okay, where have we seen at least a little bit of progress? Where have we seen change? What what has enabled that change? What are certain certain drivers that maybe we will be able to build on in the future. And of course, on the flip side, where have we not seen change and what are the blockers? And let's look at those blockers and try and understand whether we could potentially get through to those and and change those. That's one thing. But the other thing, coming back to the we need good practice examples thing, is that I have the impression that at the current moment, we face a humanitarian system that I find is almost in a state of collective depression. There's so much that needs to be done. It's so hard to do it. And in those countries that we're talking about now, Yemen, Ethiopia, Somalia, I mean, doing something positive is incredibly difficult. And people are really, really frustrated that they're not achieving more. And they do this in a global environment that's not exactly getting better for humanitarian assistance. Budgets are shrinking. Needs are rising. Law violations are are ever more blatant. And especially in that context, I have the impression that if we come back and say, you failed, you failed here, you failed there, you failed again, it's not necessarily going to help people to change things and to make a a difference. And that's why I think we need to look at what lies underneath the lack of progress and then try to find those bits of hope to say there are certain things where actually we have managed to change things. How have we done that? Could we do this elsewhere again? Because I think that that has a greater greater chance of, of achieving change in the in the end. Thanks for that. You mentioned something very important, I think, in the beginning, which certainly we didn't see as such in, in Ethiopia. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on that, which is that the, the, the gaps or the issues, the obstacles that are in the way of more effective response in, in Somalia have been looked at, have been discussed, they're well known. Well, I would say in Ethiopia the issues were well known, but there was no space really for discussion because, you know, the country team, for instance, was so polarized. There was no alignment what, whatsoever. So actually that discussion, that reflection, which should have taken place in the humanitarian country team, was entirely absent. The atmosphere was totally counterproductive to having, you know, a constructive kind of conversation in terms of how do we collectively negotiate access, how do we ensure that data actually that we have collected independently, we were able to use that in our response and able to publish that. So all these issues c- came up. What I think you're describing is a different atmosphere that where people then indeed, based on their experiences, are willing to change. I think that's what you're suggesting. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, and I think we don't have a consistent situation on on that. I, I think this is something that really varies a lot depending on the leadership that you have, and it's one of the situations where the the role of the humanitarian coordinator is really, really important, plus, of course, the role of the the heads of the agencies in, in country. And so even if you look at the same emergency response, because these people rotate quite a lot, um, this can change pretty drastically from one constellation to, to another. But there are situations where you can see quite quite a collective effort. Um, I mean, the current uh, interagency evaluation that we're doing on Somalia is quite special in the sense that it's not just looking back at the drought response, that's kind of the main mandate of this evaluation, but specifically on the request of the humanitarian coordinator, we're also looking at ongoing reform efforts. And there's a large package of reforms that the human humanitarian country team has agreed to take in response to these reports on aid diversion, or they were called post-delivery aid diversion in the case of Somalia. And while, you know, it's still way too early to to make any call at all on how effective these reforms are or how we're doing in the 
implement implementation. What is clear is that it is actually a collective effort and it involves the UN to a more limited degree the NGOs, but they have also taken on a couple of the, the, the action points in, in lead positions. And crucially, also of the donors, I think that's quite special. Um, a couple of, of key donors really play a, a lead role in bringing everything together. And people have started to talk about really sensitive issues more openly and they they try to address these things. Now, addressing them is not easy by any means because very often it's um, structural things. Ed, you mentioned data and information sharing. I think it's an, an excellent example because it's one of those where it's immediately clear just how much better the situation would be if we were sharing information. Information about fraud, information about cases of abuse, information about who are your beneficiaries and what are you giving to them and do we have duplications in, in our lists um, can we check that between ourselves we get a more even distribution all, all these kinds of purposes of information sharing and the agency interests that stand against sharing that information are massive and it does take very very committed people to bang heads together and there will still be huge institutional obstacles because the systems are not interoperable and it's very easy to say, oh, you know, we have data protection concerns and our legal offices need to test this for three years. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being polemic. But it's very easy to, to hide behind concerns, some of which are legitimate. But in the end, it's the interest in holding the data, owning the data, because the more beneficiaries you are able to register, the better your case for fundraising is. So I think we come up uh, against quite deeply embedded kind of interest structures that are hard, hard to address. But there are committed individuals who, who, who try. I mean, at least what it sounds to me, Julia, is that there's a vertical ground somehow for a more constructive discussion, at least a very different atmosphere, the way you describe it, than what I saw in um, Ethiopia. Uh, Louis, let's talk a little bit then about follow-up and the willingness to change, because I think you also particularly had some experience on that with regards to the Yemen evaluation, and now maybe also because other than indeed uh, leading the, the review on the IDP, uh, the humanitarian response to IDPs, you're obviously also involved in the flagship project. What would you see are the issues in, in relation to creating an environment where you actually can discuss change, where you can discuss how do we collectively make improvements to the response? Could you describe that a little bit? Yeah, good questions. And we've now raised many issues and it's quite difficult to talk across all of them, but I'll I'll give it a go. I said at the outset, we had a pretty benign environment in Yemen. We had an incoming humanitarian coordinator, resident coordinator, who was interested in evidence and interested in that system-wide look. We had an excellent deputy humanitarian coordinator who'd also come in relatively recently, also very interested. You know, that first layer, the, the leadership being really important in country in terms of setting the tone as to whether you have a permissive environment or a very difficult environment, tremendously important varies from context to context. Yemen at that point had been this enormous biggest ever humanitarian response. Half the people in Yemen receiving food aid, five, six billion dollar a year, and six years without a system-wide evaluation of that nature. Long overdue, massive system-wide response, massive investment by the humanitarian collective. And on that country level, because we did have a permissive environment, and even some of the agencies who were reluctant came round and bought into it, we, we had a pretty good reception. It was rocky, at the beginning, because, you know, we said some tough things. I think we had a thousand comments on our first draft. The pages of comments were longer than the report itself. But we kind of got through that process and we got to a management response in country that they took really seriously. And these management responses, it's very easy when you have a lot of recommendations for the UN to pick the nice ones and dump the difficult ones and say, well, we've done two thirds of the recommendations, so so we're ahead. But there was a genuine engagement. Engagement. And I was lucky enough with the IDP review to go back a year later to Yemen and talk to the colleagues there. And, they, and they've been following up on a quarterly basis, e even submitting to the donors progress against the management response on, on the evaluation. And the donors said to me later, they said, I don't know why they're sending us this. We didn't even ask for it. You, you know, in country, they were actually really enthusiastic, not across all of the recommendations, of course, the usual interagency games and so on. But in a broad sense, they they bought into their responsibility to follow up. Now. The next level, there's nothing. And I think that's really interesting, right? So after the Yemen evaluation, we'd 
done all of these massive debriefs with the in-country colleagues, and this was a six billion dollar response. Yemen on the edge of famine. You would have thought that the system beyond Yemen might be interested in learning lessons from the Yemen experience. No way to take it. No interface with the wider system. The brilliant head of evaluation in Ottawa at the time, who was managing the system-wide responses, managed to get us on the EDG agenda. We did a briefing on the basis of that. The OPAG was interested, so we went and talked to the OPAG. All of our all of our gloriously opaque acronyms in the humanitarian world. So the emergency directors group and the operational policy and group of the interagency stand, standing committee, the ISC. So we went and did all of these briefings and they were like, oh yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you so much for that. Nothing. No follow-up. No mechanism. And there were wider issues. Fast forward to the IDP review. That was collectively an ISC ask, commissioned by the ISC, very much engaged with by the deputies group. Again, brilliant deputy uh, uh, Archer under Martin. Martin, I think, has been a fantastic ERC. Joyce is his deputy. He's been getting on with, it, with the deputies. Followed very diligently the IDP review through, and we're now at the point where there's a management response in in the ISC to the IDP review, which is good. There will be some follow-up to that, but again, structurally, we're not really connected between these few little moments where we can review the system as a whole. And that takes us back to Julia's point about collectively, we have looked at places like Somalia for 30 years. We've got some brilliant people out there in our sector writing fabulous papers about everything that is flawed in our system. System and, and yet, <laughs> where do you take that? Julia, I'm curious in that sense how you look at this. I think you particularly already raised this issue, which I think is what Lewis is also touching on, the deeper system issues. Is it individual agency priorities? How do the individual agency priorities relate to the collective ones? What if indeed an agency doesn't necessarily follow the plans that are in a, in a humanitarian response plan, for instance, and so on? So these are perhaps more questions that touch on how the system work and, and they're more systemic. Many of those, in fact, I saw in Ethiopia, the, the issue there is precisely follow up and working on change at the global level. What, what are your thoughts or your expectations on that, particularly in relation to the evaluation you're working on at the moment, but perhaps also based on your previous experience in terms of the drought response in Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I think the, the experience, my experience in the past has been very similar to Lewis's. So in Ethiopia, when we looked at the drought response there, I think generally people at country level were, were open. I think they got overtaken by events, and this is a big challenge at, at country level. You know, and the next crisis tends to be always just around the corner. And perhaps, Ed, I mean, since you conducted the next interagency humanitarian evaluation in, in Ethiopia, I think it'd be interesting to hear also where you saw, you know, changes from what we had found just a couple of years earlier and where not. Um, I think, for instance, I remember the big issue we brought up about data reliability um, that seemed to have been exactly the same, where we had such fabulous quantitative proof that the data were just cooked, and yet the humanitarian system seems to have done nothing in, 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 in the interim, and then the, a very different kind of crisis hits. But otherwise, you know, I think there, there are people often at country level who, who want to drive that, and my big frustration at the end of the Ethiopia evaluation was also the global level, the, the huge difficulty of even finding an audience. I mean, as you said, Lewis, you know, we, we had very committed people in, in Ocha trying to help and also managing to get the odd slot, short time slot to just present findings and people were then very politely nodding and saying, yes, yes, we heard this before and so on. And then to my knowledge, nothing that happened. And in fact, when we started the Somalia evaluation, we heard the same frustration from the country team saying we had an operational peer review here that raised issues and we took certain of these to the global level. The country team, the humanitarian coordinator did that, saying, for example, data sharing is something where they need global level agreements to, to help facilitate that at country level and got extremely little response. So even if a humanitarian coordinator knocks at the doors of, of these governance mechanisms, it's very hard to get a response. When we discussed whether we should do this Somalia evaluation, 
situation. Um, for me, that was the make or break point was to try and establish was there support for embedding this as much as possible on a political level or, or not? And was there also in the planning enough time and, and budget? I mean, we tend to do this as a hobby afterwards to keep disseminating. And I love that. I, I will keep doing that as well. But it's a lot easier if it's sort of factored into into a project. And so I'm a good spirits because there are, again, excellent people at, at OCHA really trying to, to help and, and push that. But I wish that there was a more consistent understanding among the agencies as well and their evaluation functions that that is actually their core job. Yes, of course, they need to ensure that the quality is managed and that all the protocols are adhered to and that all the processes are correct. But I have seen a huge tendency to only do that or to blow these processes up to such a proportion that there's no time for anything else. And Lewis, if you say, you know, a thousand comments on a draft, and I don't know how many rounds of commenting you went through, but we sure went through many, many, many of those. And there is just a, such an energy suck from this process orientation. I wish we had more allies in the evaluation departments who understand that at the end of the day, we are doing this in order to change things. It doesn't stop at identifying what went well and what didn't go so well and making some recommendations. That's where the work starts. And that's where we need those allies in the organizations. And they start in the evaluation departments. That's my big wish for the future is that um, we get a greater realization and, and more allies. It's a really brilliant point, uh, Julia. I think on two, on, on two issues you um, spoke very well. Clearly, there's too much of a process, too heavy process, but particularly I think what you're pointing to is also almost the time lost in the sense of actually discussing the findings and ensuring that there are changes or at least adjustments made in, in real time. There's a risk for a mechanical sort of management response, whereas in fact, you know, a lot of this is after the fact. Yes, it's still important for the response to war isn't over in parts of of Ethiopia, far from it, unfortunately, but there is important time lost. The other point I think you raised very well, the lack of follow-up on data in Ethiopia, that was exactly our starting point. What has been done in terms of, you know, putting in safeguards to ensure that data was actually more credible or more reliable and nothing, as you said, was done. And usually then, particularly, of course, in a war situation where the politics are enormous, that didn't get any better. So the manipulation or the interference only got worse and as a result what we ended up with with the conclusion was that on the basis of data we cannot even make a judgment in terms of what agencies have done in terms of their performance. Now what you both I think pointed to is particularly the issue around the global level in terms of lack of follow-up. Lewis I'm curious what you think in terms of now the system being overwhelmed at the global level and it's not only at the country level the next crisis but also at the global level you know with so many crises going on so what is even their capacity to ensure follow-up, to, to put in place an agenda for change. I'm curious, Lewis, given that you particularly work on the flagship project, what your take is on that. Some of the systemic issues in terms of the incentives for individual agency profile and so on, they may still be in the way, and these are precisely the systemic issues. So what, what's your thinking on that, Lewis? So I think... Huh. Uh, I want to answer that question and I want to go back to the data issue because um, because it's so core to everything we do as evaluators and I, I would argue core to the system as well. But let's touch on the flagship and maybe we'll circle back to that, Ed, if we have time as well. I think you're right that the system is overwhelmed, but also the system is so big these days. The system is almost $50 billion a year. I, I had the privilege to work on the IDP review with Kevin Kennedy, who's a, a long-standing humanitarian coordinator, deputy head at Archer at one time, fantastic in all round individual. But Kev Kevin was telling me in 2000, the appeal, the global appeal was $2 billion. So we've had a 25 fold increase in the last 25 years in terms of the volume of humanitarian assistance globally. And I think that the pressures of all of these crises, Sudan on the edge of famine, Gaza, Somalia, Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Myanmar, all, all, all of them, all at the same time, absolutely overwhelming 
harming the system, the capacity, the resources of the system. And I think that does limit the bandwidth in terms of uptake and in terms of thinking through how you might change this ever more complex system. One of the realities of more complexity and more bureaucracy is just that it reflects the reality of a bigger and bigger and bigger system that is naturally subject then to the demands of more scrutiny from the donors who are giving the money. The flagship is, I think, a really heartfelt attempt by the outgoing emergency relief coordinator to try and reorient the system back towards the people we serve, to take up on those World Humanitarian Summit commitments around localization and putting people at the center. It, it, it has proved to be incredibly difficult because of that bandwidth issue, because of the complexity issue, because of the overwhelmed by crises issue. But I don't think it's necessarily a failure yet. It's just achieving change in a system that doesn't have a command and control structure has to be about all sorts of ways of persuasion as well as process and hard data. Let me just touch on data, if, if you'll permit me, <laughs> because that was a huge issue in Yemen as well. There's a piece in the Yemen IHE about how the data quality is poor to the point of being irrelevant. We, we all know the systemic flaws around people in need numbers, which are relatively meaningless, and then people reached numbers which are even more meaningless, I would argue that we need to start at the base again. The humanitarian appeals come out year on year, and yet we don't have an equivalent humanitarian report year on year that says whether we've achieved the outcomes that we set ourselves as a system. I find this almost criminal. Donors are putting money in year after year to these appeals. Many of them, like Somalia, have been 30 years and counting, and yet every year we say the same thing. Oh, we need this many children in, in need of nutritional assistance, this many people in need of clean drinking water. We never say you know, what have we achieved. I mean, we do in parts, but we don't say it systematically. You know, what's the progress on nutrition? And this this kind of systematic reporting would, would demand an outcomes focus in, in terms of our data gathering. So instead of collecting meaningless numbers about how many things we've distributed, we might start to use actually the data that we have that says this many feeding centres, this much progress in reduction of SAM and GAM, and this, we can start to link to our interventions and then we can start to put together that. If we had that kind of picture around progress over time, because we are in these places for multiple years and we had academic studies of the nature that you and Julia were talking about in terms of excess mortality, we could put those kinds of analyses together and paint a much richer picture. And then you wouldn't be reliant on these periodic IHEs. And then when we did our job, actually it would be easier because there'd be a collective understanding of, of what the issues are. One final thought, when I when I was looking at the IDP review, we were looking at academic studies that were talking about excess mortality in IDP populations. Now, there's some suggestion that IDPs are worse off in terms of excess mortality and health outcomes, but the studies are vanishingly few, and that is really odd in a sector that spends so much money over so much time. Thanks for that, Lewis. Julia, Lewis obviously raising a very important point that an IHE, actually the trigger, as we know for it, is a system-wide scale-up for crises where there is no system-wide scale-up on the side, they are, they are not even taking place. They're rather a heavy tool, and we already have talked about, you know, how long the process is. What Lewis is talking about is much more regular monitoring, ensuring that actually an IAG is not so much a particular snapshot of a particular crisis, but actually that, you know, it follows the sequence in time. My question really, thinking of the future when it comes to assessing collective performance, which is what IAGs do. Do you see other tools that perhaps should be developed or that are already in place that should be used more in order to ensure, let's say, continuous learning and accountability? Any thoughts on that? Yes, of course. Two, perhaps. One is that for these interagency humanitarian evaluations, which, which I think are crucial and should stay, there should always be a component that then looks at the systemic level and asks from all the previous recommendations that came and these requests for change, how have we done in the meantime? So that we use the opportunity of each country-specific interagency humanitarian evaluation to also say, okay, let's do an update on what has happened in the meantime on the global level. And maybe that will increase the visibility, the transparency, and the pressure um, to move at that level. But then you bring up the question of what happens to smaller crises. And I think it's important to be clear that the bigger crises don't just get the interagency humanitarian evaluations, they also get the operational peer reviews, which happen early, I don't know, but earlier, and they're very
very much learning focused and the way they are, the teams are composed sort of really speaks to that learning orientation. And I do think these are very valuable and especially for the country level, you know, immediate change. And um, we used to have these real time evaluations, which were a nice idea, but in the way they were implemented, firstly, they also went to the big crises only and they were really, really real time. They, they, the kind of the processes were too heavy for them to, to happen early enough. So something that we have been discussing a little bit on the sidelines as part of this humanitarian to humanitarian initiative, the H2 H network was to see whether it would not be possible to have like a, a common service that doesn't need a heavy interagency steering group, but you know, a, a light existing terms of reference. Essentially, what we want to know, you know, how's it working? What's going well? What's not going well? Where do we need to adjust? You don't need three month terms of reference development process for that. That could send a learning oriented team into emerging crises accompanying that. It's very surprisingly difficult to pull this off. In, in, in reality, I think there was interest by uh, some donors to, to look into that and offer that as a common service. I think we would have the same problem that we have with the interagency humanitarian evaluations of saying, OK, if somebody just offers this learning, who, who will make sure that somebody will pick it up? But I do think there is um, space for a learning oriented early light kind of intervention, because these things at the end of the day, they're not rocket science. You get a fairly accurate picture, I think, of the situation pretty quickly, you can then go a lot, lot further and gather so much more evidence and interview so many more people. But you reach the point of saturation or or close to saturation, usually pretty quickly. So I think it'd be quite feasible to do things if you have experienced people that will bring to the table the key issues very quickly. And I do think also the the smaller or the emerging things very early on could really benefit from that. Precondition is that you have a humanitarian coordinator who wants that. Lewis? any reflections on these uh, suggestions or recommendations from Julia and as to the future of monitoring and learning and accountability I would say in relation to collective performance I mean I think I think what Julia said is is an excellent idea great and I think the operational peer reviews have tried to do that and haven't always done it so having some light touch capacity is an excellent idea I'm not going to reiterate my points about outcomes level data and that's a battle we've all been fighting for many years so, so maybe a final thought is is around the donor role in this. I do believe that the donors have a responsibility in in demanding that we get better as a system in both the the hard data that matters, uh, interagency, interoperable data around what we're achieving, not what we're purchasing and and storing in warehouses. So there's something about that, and then there's also something about telling the story. This is all of these mechanisms that we're talking about. They need to be valued by the sector and they will only be valued by the sector if those organisations leaderships feel like they have to take them seriously and ultimately it's the donors who set the tone they tell us all the time you know they have a, a responsibility for the stewardship of public funds we hear about value for money well in my mind value for money starts with knowing whether you're achieving what you set out to achieve you know I really feel that as much as the donors are fragmented as much much as they also have political interests. Again, their colleagues who are heavily invested in whether the sector works or not, and, and they're the ones with the power to demand that this stuff happens more routinely. So over to them. Well, with that, let's hope they hear our messages. We have really, uh, you in particular, uh, have indicated the value, the importance, and particularly also the need for follow-up. The challenges, many challenges that are involved in, in that, but there are things Julianne Lewis and I think that you pointed to that can or should should be done maybe already they should have been done a long long time ago but we know progress in the humanitarian sector is incremental in that sense. Thanks really to both of you for sharing your thoughts and, and experiences in conducting uh, interagency humanitarian evaluations. It's certainly our hope that some of the, or even all of the suggestions that you have mentioned will be taken forward. We will certainly speaking as uh, the director of here Geneva will certainly be following and, and also stimulating this debate with donors, precisely, I think, as you said, Louis. Julia, good luck with continuing the inter humanitarian evaluation for Somalia. Louis, you good luck with, uh, with the flagship uh, project. And again, thank you really for, uh, for sharing your views and, uh, and experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. And thanks, Julia.
for tuning in to this episode of Hear Hear, the Humanitarian Podcast. This podcast is available on Spotify or YouTube. To find out more about our work, please visit hear-geneva.org, follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn at Hear Geneva, or subscribe to our YouTube channel.